Today I want to share one of my favorite results from elementary set theory, and that is that the cardinality of the real numbers is equal to the cardinality of the power set of the natural numbers. So let's recall that the power set of the natural numbers is the set of all subsets of the natural numbers. So if you can think of a subset of the natural numbers, that will be an element of the power set. So three ex examples would be the empty set, that's a subset of any set, the set containing one, two, three, and then the entire natural numbers. Of course, you can take a power set of any set, but since we're looking at the natural numbers here, this is the example we'll have down here. Okay, another thing to recall is the definition of what it means for two sets to be equinumerous or equal in cardinality. And that goes like this. So we say sets A and B are equal in cardinality, and we write A with this equal sign and under, underscore C, B, if there is a bijection from A to B. So in other words, a one-to-one -one and on-to map between A and B. Okay, so here's an outline for our process today. First, we'll show that the set of real numbers and the closed interval 0, 1 are equal in cardinality. And that will require three steps. Well, really two steps, and then we'll use a theorem. The first step is to write down an injection that goes from the real numbers to that set containing 0, 1, or that's that closed interval 0 to 1. So an injective function or a 1 to 1 function. Our next step will be to find an injection, a one-to-one -one function, in the reverse direction. So from the closed interval 0, 1 to the real numbers. Then we can use the Schroeder-Bernstein theorem, which is actually highly non-trivial to prove. And that says there's a bijection from the real numbers to the closed interval 0, 1. So in other words, if you've got injections in both directions, then you have a bijection. Um, furthermore, it also says that if you have surjections in both directions, then you also have a bijection. So this theorem is really important because often it's easier to produce an injection than it is to produce a surjection. So if you can find inject injective maps in both directions, you're good to go. Then our second main step will be to show that this closed interval 0, 1 is equal in cardinality to the power set of the natural numbers, and we'll do that by constructing an explicit bijection between these two sets. Okay, so now that we've got this outline reviewed, as well as the necessary definitions, let's get into it. Okay, so let's first exhibit an injection from the real numbers to the set 0 to 1, so that closed interval from 0 to 1. And there's a couple of ways to do this. The way that I like to do it involves the inverse tangent function. So let's recall that if we have the graph of y equal arc tan x, then we have these nice horizontal asymptotes. There's a horizontal asymptote up here at pi over 2, and there's one down here at minus pi over 2. And then the graph has the following shape. So it goes something like this. So let's notice that this graph is most definitely one-to-one, -one, although we can check that carefully as well just by the definition of these, this inverse tangent um, or this arctan function. Um, furthermore, this graph does not hit all real numbers. It's constrained between minus pi over 2 and pi over 2. So if we can squeeze and shift this a little bit, that'll give us an injective map from r to 0, 1. And how can we do that? Well, maybe like this is the best way. Let's set f of x equal to, so maybe it'll be 1 half plus 1 over pi times arctan of x. Okay, so let's see what effect that has on our original parent function, the inverse tangent function. So this 1 over pi will squeeze this kind of interval between minus pi over 2 and minus pi over 2 to an interval between, let's see, minus half and half. 
and then this half will shift it up to an interval between zero and one. So that means here we now have a horizontal asymptote at zero and another horizontal asymptote at one and our final picture looks something like that. So this actually gives us a bijective map. So F is a bijective map from the real numbers onto the open interval containing zero and one. But if it's bijective onto the open interval zero, one, and it misses zero, one, that means it's injective onto the closed interval zero, one. Okay, then how would we like properly check that this is injective? Well, maybe let's take two numbers, x and y from R, such that f of x equals f of y, but then that means that arctan of x equals arctan of y. But then let's recall how the arctan is defined. It's defined to be a special angle so that when you plug it into the tangent function, you get this number x out. But also it's defined to be the unique number between minus pi over two and pi over two that satisfies that. So that means if we apply tangent to both sides, that will cancel out and give us x equals y. So this may seem like a little bit of a cheat, but in fact, the arctan is kind of constructed to be one-to-one -one as part of its definition. And notice I did some arithmetic between this step right here where f of x equals f of y and arctan of x equals arctan of y, but that follows pretty easily. Okay, so like I said, we've got a bijection onto the open interval zero, one, which means we have um, an injection onto that closed interval. Okay, now we need an injective map from zero, one, closed interval to the real numbers. And in this case, we can go for a super easy one, and that maybe takes just the number x in the closed interval from zero to one and pushes it to the number x in the real numbers. So this is most definitely a one-to-one -one function. It is far from being an onto function, but we don't need it to be an onto function because we really need, just need injective functions in both directions. So now these two blue dots together with Schroeder-Bernstein will tell us that indeed the set of real numbers is equinumerous with this closed interval zero, one. So that means we just need to prove that second half, which was in our outline. So let's get to that. So now we're ready to finish this off, and this is going to require another application of the Schroeder-Bernstein theorem. So we'll start by making an injective map from the power set of natural numbers to the set containing 0, 1, and then we'll get another injective map in the other direction. Okay, so let's see maybe how we can do this. So we need to take a subset of natural numbers and produce a number between zero and one. So I think there's probably a number of ways to do this, but let's do it as follows. So let's take A, which is a subset of natural numbers. Let's enumerate the values from A or the numbers in A. So A1, A2, A3, so on and so forth. So that may be finite. And then we will define our number, which is f evaluated at a, to be equal to the sum as n goes from 1 to infinity of a n over 10 to the n, where a n is equal to, let's see, 1 if n is n a, and then a n is equal to zero if n is not in a. Great, so something like this. So for example, the set containing one, three, seven, and nine will get mapped to the following number. So this will be one over 10 plus one over 10 cubed plus one over 10 to the seven plus one over 10 to the nine. So something like this. And it's easy to check that this is an injective function. So it misses lots of values from zero to one, but it is an injective function. 
Okay, so next we want to create an injective function from 0, 1 to the power set of n. Now, how can we do this? Well, let's take a number x from the set containing 0, 1, and then write it as its binary expansion. So that means we can write x as 0 point a1, a2, a3, a4, and so on and so forth. But there's a little bit of a worry here because this expansion as a, in binary is not unique. So we will choose a particular expansion to say that is our standard expansion. And that is the one that ends in all ones if possible. So for example, the number one is 0 0.111 and so on and so forth. That continues forever. The, point, the number 0 0.1, which is really like the number half in this binary expansion. Let's point out that this over here is binary. So this is A comes from the set 0 and 1. So this is like the half place. This is like the quarter place instead of the tenth and the hundredth and so on and so forth. So 0 0.1, that's equal to a half. But that's the same thing as 0 0.01 and then that repeats. A quarter plus an eighth plus a sixteenth and so on and so forth. So what we will do is require that everything is of the following form. So it ends in all ones if possible. The only time that's not possible is if we have the number zero. And now we'll define the set G of X by the following rule. So the number N is an element of G of X if and only if um, a sub n is equal to 1 in the expansion. But now we can pretty easily check that this is injective. Let's say that x equals 0 0.a1, a2. Let's say y is equal to 0 0.b1, b2, so on and so forth. And then let's also suppose that g of x equals g of y and that uh, a sub n is equal to one. But notice that means that a, that n is in g of x, which is equal to g of y, but that means that b of n is also equal to one. But then likewise, if a n is equal to zero, that means that n is not in g of x, which is equal to g of y, which means that b of n is also equal to zero. But that's gotta be true for all natural numbers n. So putting this together, we have that x is equal to y. And we're good to go, we have injectivity. Now I'd like to notice that some sets are not hit under, the, under this mapping. In other words, it is not surjective. And why is that? Well, for example, this number 0 0.1, which is going to be expressed as 0.0111111 forever and ever and ever, under this mapping, if we were allowed to express it like this, would turn into the singleton one. But like I said, we're taking this as a requirement for our expression. And so in fact, that's the set two, three, four, so on and so forth. So it's essentially the complement of the set contain or the singleton one. So again, we've produced an injection, but not a surjection. But we've got injections in both directions, which means by Schroeder-Bernstein, we in fact do have equinumerosity between 0, 1, and the power set of n. And then by our outline that we discussed earlier, that establishes this result. And that's a good place to stop.